welcome to Coming Home, Survive and Thrive in Homeschooling. Today I'm talking with Phyllis Titchen, the owner of True Health Limited. She's also the local coordinator for the Western A. Price Foundation in Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. On their website I read, The Western A. Price Foundation is your source for accurate information on nutrition and health, always aiming to provide the scientific validation of traditional food ways. People seeking health today often condemn certain food groups, such as grains, dairy foods, meat, salt, fat, sauces, sweets and nightshade vegetables. But the wise traditions diet is inclusive not exclusive. End quote. I am particularly excited about today's interview. Healthy food has been an interest for me since my late teens, which is quite some time ago. The book by Sally Fallon, Nourishing Traditions, and the Western A. Price Foundation was introduced to me around 20 years ago via the benefits of raw or unpasteurized milk. Eating this way has featured in our family life even when I ate a high raw diet. Part one of our interview includes an excellent slideshow as Phyllis explains what Dr. Price did and what is happening now via the Western A. Price Foundation website and their international chapters. Part 2, coming at a later date, explores the implementation into the home and how homeschooling can incorporate the principles and practice as valid teaching tools. This fulfills my favourite life quote of learn how to think and not what to think. And the second one, the world is your classroom. If you don't agree with some or all of the presentation, then I commend to you the important life skill of applying the how to think just mentioned. No one has the full truth and no matter how much we agree or disagree, it's important to be able to say why and be prepared to update or change our current way of a healthy life. What we want our children to know in how to evaluate the information around them also means we need the humility to change tack. Humble pie is a dish I'm learning to eat when necessary. Well, Phyllis, I am absolutely delighted to welcome you onto my podcast. I'm so excited to talk to you, actually, because I have been interested in Western A. Price for quite some years, but I still feel quite elementary in my knowledge, even though we, we lived this way and still do to a certain extent. So I'm so keen to hear what you've got to say. Thank you so much for coming on. It's my pleasure. I'm, I'm always delighted to share this information because um, with a, a scientific background and thanks to my mother, you know, pretty, at least for the time, um, unusual and closer to optimal nutrition. Um, as the six of us were growing up in California, I'm, I'm keen to be able to present the information so that other people can use it. And those were actually, I mean, you teach, you teach, you teach were apparently the dying words of Dr. Weston A. Price. He was so, so keen that this information make it out into um, the mainstream and be used by people around the world. Oh, I, I think he'd be quite satisfied then. I hope he'd be satisfied. Mm -hmm. Phyllis, why don't we start? Tell us, tell us your story. How do you become to be doing this? Well, um, I am a, I'm the volunteer chapter leader for the Hawks Bay Weston A. Price Foundation, which means I'm responsible for keeping a list of where sources of organic or nutrient-dense food can be had locally, answer questions, and um, to create talks and events. And I have been doing that since around 2010. But my fascination with nutrition 
um, has its basis in my mother reading uh, Dr. Adele Davis's nutrition books post World War II, um, and that was that made her quite distinct from most of the in providing us the nutrition that wasn't really standard at that time in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So I'm very grateful to her, but it, I was always aware that um, my family ate differently from other families. And I remember being rather embarrassed on a continuing basis about my school lunches because they were always homemade, whole meal, bread, and you know, very little peanut butter and jelly. Um, and certainly no desserts and no processed foods. So that's, you know, in hindsight, um, I wasn't particularly grateful then, but I certainly am now for the, um, the orientation and the basic core health that my parents provided us with. And I grew up on a, a lifestyle block um, and we did have cows and we did eat um, raw milk had a variety of animals and a vegetable garden and ate in effect no processed food i think the some of the most processed food we had was spaghetti dried spaghetti but there were no we didn't have any canned things other than possibly canned tomatoes on our shelves so we made bread once a week ate loaves of bread and um, lots of raw milk and plenty of eggs. So I like to attribute my, my at least my um, hopefully clarity of thought and generally okay health to, um, to that kind of beginning. And I think it's very, very important. It's never too late to, to change things with your, um, by adopting um, more nutrient dense, cleaner, more traditional food into your diet. So strongly encourage people to do that. So I grew up in the Santa Clara Valley in California. I attended university um, and studied soil science and environmental policy and management. Met my Kiwi husband who was there doing his um, doctoral degree in ecology. Um, he had originally grew up in Porongahau, which is the reason I am still living in Central Hawks Bay. Um, so yes, um, once my children and I, I did for periods of time homeschool my children using mostly the um, Calvert curriculum out of the United States, which I found to be excellent, rigorous, um, and classical. I learned a lot from doing that at, at that stage, and that rather surprised me. Um, so that's my background with homeschooling, and when my children were fledged, I went back to my interest in soils and agriculture and did organic agriculture courses and was mentored by Dr. Arden Anderson, um, a biological agriculture specialist and MD, um, and Dr. Paul Detloff, who was an organic vet in the United States. So that gradually evolved into me doing soils consulting for organic and regenerative farms around New Zealand and developing uh, my current business, True Health Limited, that provides organically certified plant-based remedies, so tinctures and essential oils of a variety of plants to the New Zealand dairy industry, particularly organically certified dairies to help them wean themselves off their reliance on antibiotics. And that kind of brings me to my main passion, which is helping farmers understand how to grow nutrient-dense, spray-free, preferably organic, food as their sacred trust, if you will, um, as farmers, that they not only help heal the land, but they can also, through their food, help heal us. So that's me. 
All right, thank you. Great introduction. I, I know that the Western A Price Foundation, because of the book Nourishing Traditions, which was lent to me by a good friend when I first heard about him, which really got me interested in. Can you please talk about what are Nourishing Traditions and the Western A Price Foundation? How would you explain that? The Western A Price Foundation was created in the early 2000s by Sally Fallon and Dr. Mary Ennig to popularize, if you will, and make more available the wealth of information that Dr. Weston A. Price and his wife developed or that they researched in the 30s and 40s because Price had been quite um, a well-respected um, dentist in the you know late 1800s and into the um, 1930s when he sort of semi-retired. He'd been the president of what became the American Dental Association. He was the director of a laboratory for that association with up to 70 technicians working in it. So big stuff. And he um, did 20 years worth of research into root canals and their dangers. And when he retired, he, he went in the early 30s for about 10 or 12 years every Sometimes at some stage during the year, they would go to another continent and specifically seek out tribes or populations of people who were still eating their traditional diet, no matter whether those were Inuits in the Arctic Circle or Pygmies in Africa or remote villages in the Swiss Alps or East Coast Maori in New Zealand. But there were 14 or 15 different groups that he was able to locate and with a fair amount of um, challenging travel actually get to these remote locations to do full anthropological and dental and physical medical exams on these people and to take samples of their food, which were then preserved and sent back to the um, Dental Association lab for analysis. Now, it turns out that that was quite prescient that he did that research then while those groupings of people were still eating what they would have been eat, eating for hundreds, if not thousands of years. And he was able to look at their health, their social structure, um, and particularly his specialty, their dental health, and took pictures of all of those things. That research cannot be repeated because pretty much all of the populations of traditional cultures around the world have been corrupted in the last 80 years um, by what Price called the corrupting foods of modern commerce, which degenerated their health, their facial structure um, within a generation, which is what he proved. So he's Mary Inig and um, Sally Fallon have, have done a tremendous job in creating a new foundation that actually focuses very outward looking at nutrition. And it has amazing conferences, has um, a subscription to um, a journal that is both academic and you know appealing to the public and a website that is just laden with information. So something I strongly encourage everyone to look at is the Weston A. Price Foundation website. And you can go down numerous rabbit holes learning an astonishing amount. All of the past journals are there. So it's it's like a 
multi-year course in nutrition. But when we talk about traditional diets or traditional nourishment, we're talking about unprocessed food that has been eaten and resulted in extremely healthy populations on an ongoing basis. Okay, so next to no dental decay, very few birthing problems, broad faces, happy, peaceful, intelligent people. Wow. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's say a family are very interested in learning more. So clearly we go to the website, we've got fabulous journals to, to read. So apart from reading and getting started like that, how would you recommend a family get started? Uh, what do they need to change first? Um, I'm just going to sound a little drastic, but they need to go through their cupboards and toss out all pretty much of the processed food so anything that comes in a package anything that you would eat directly out of a package or that you you know minimally cook um is is processed food and it will be bereft of basic nutrition minerals vitamins and enzymes it will be dead food and it really does not lend nutrition to your cells and it certainly adds a lot of neurotoxins a lot of pesticides usually and um also a whole bunch of processing chemicals including flavor stimulants addictive substances um reactive dyes you name it um, anything that kind of doesn't doesn't come straight out of a vegetable garden or out of an animal um, is these days suspicious. It's not traditional food. It is not good for you. And yes, I know this can be like a but, but, but it's so much more convenient. And I have to ask the uncomfortable question of, um, what's convenient about cancer? Nothing. It's very costly. And yes, living this way may cost a little bit more unless you're raising a lot of the animals and the food yourself. But ultimately, it's worth it because you're actually getting real food that nourishes your cells, that, it, that is high in vitamin and minerals, particularly the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K2, which are crucial for healthy children in particular. It's, we, we all need it, but we really notice the difference um, in children, and it affects their brain capacity, um, their musculature, uh, their dental health, and their ability to concentrate and be calm and to learn. So go through your cupboard and remove all those things. I mean, yes, this is a bit of an exercise and it's not something you necessarily want to spring on your family, but if you're in charge of the the food procurement and cooking, you can make some changes right away with simply getting rid of that processed food and cooking in batches so that you have something constantly in the freezer that you can just pull out, um, heat up and have a meal. That's the kind of convenience food you, know, you need to be focusing on, um, not the kind that comes in a package with a very high cost on a variety of fronts. So first thing is to get rid of the processed food. And then I would say the next thing is to look for sources of preferably organic, certain, you know, if at all possible, local um, meat, eggs, and raw milk. If simply adding raw milk and lots of high quality eggs to your diet um, is, is probably the most palatable and important first step. It will be challenging for you to find raw milk, but 
um, that's what I advocate. If I would certainly say if you're eating low fat or no fat milk, stop. If you're eating any form of the, you know, soy, oat, what have you milks, stop. If you can't find raw milk, just stop eating those, in my opinion, somewhat poisonous, high sugar substitutes. If you can't have the real thing, just don't go there. So I'll stop there. They've, Unless I'm you wanted thinking, me to expand on that. They're, they're very popular at the moment. You know, the mm -hmm. oat milk, coconut milk, um, yeah. you know, rice milk, soy milk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People should read the labels very closely, particularly looking at the carbohydrate content. These things are dripping sugar. And unless it's unless it's organic um, sugar, uh, if it's say some form of corn sugar or high fructose syrup or even non-organic cane sugar, it will be drenched in carcinogenic glyphosate mm. and dripping with sugar, which is not conducive to um, good body function or calm centered children. What about making your own alternative um, milks? It's a lot of work. Yeah. I would certainly, I used to, I mean, I put my hand up for one of my great mistakes and that was in the um, mid eighties, believing that Dairy was not good for me, and it was laden with pesticides and that, and antibiotics specifically, and that um, soy milk was a good substitute. And I did injure my children's health and hormone balance doing that, and it's one of my great regrets. So soy is decidedly off the list, but if you, unless they're organic and unless all of their ingredients are organic and there's low, low calories in them um why go there they're uh, even making them at home it's a lot of work i know i used to make soy milk before you know you could buy soy milk at the drop of a hat in supermarkets in new zealand and it's just not worth it I, you know for that you could be milking a goat or finding a dairy farmer and making a trip out there once a month to get organic raw milk that you can then freeze and Defrost. That would be my suggestion. You can, you should be able to go on the Weston A. Price website under local chapters, the international section, and see where the Weston A. Price chapter leaders like myself are throughout the country. And it's their job to be able to point you towards sources of raw milk in your area, in your region. Mm, that's really helpful advice then. And a lot of those uh, getting started techniques that you just described then, I think they're quite doable. I do understand that for a family who have never done anything like that, that could be quite overwhelming. But you, you suggested uh, meat, um, the eggs and butter, and, and if possible, to try and get hold of raw milk. They're good places to start, not hard. Yep. Hmm. And the the thing is, with kids, when you transition them to this approach to eating, just expect that if you have been eating processed foods or boxed cereals um, or even, you know, oatmeal, porridge, if you will, there will be some resistance because there is a degree of hidden addiction to these products. I know that's hard to stomach, um, but it's there, it happens. I'm not going to say it's purposeful, but it's certainly negligent of the food processing industry um, to be putting these products on the market. And I, I absolutely agree that, you know, the with the with the maxim of shopping on the aisles, you know, around the perimeter in all of the 
everything that has to be either refrigerated or or is in the vegetable section, fresh vegetable section. Everything in the inside aisles is usually highly processed. Anything that's going to last outside of the refrigerator for more than a week um, is probably not something you want to be eating. Okay. Is before we um, get specific advice as how to apply this to to homeschooling, mm -hmm. it, do you think it would be a good idea to to look at these great slides you've got that mm -hmm. that have got the education factor in them? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, happy right. to do that. And I'm going to try to move through quickly because many of these same images and. Um, information you can find on the website. I've just been selective in trying to shorten it and you know to give you an idea of why it's important to shift towards more nutrient dense um, nutrition and to mimic the wise traditions of yes our European ancestors but understanding that Wherever Weston A. Price went, he found similar, and they were eating their traditional diets. I mean, all sorts of different diets, you know, from mostly seal blubber to, you know, oftentimes extreme things like lots of crickets or grasshoppers. But in, invariably, when he took those foods back to the lab and analyzed them, what he found were there was a high levels of vitamin and minerals in them and they were all uh, had many many times more vitamin a and vitamin d than his cincinnati ohio dental patients in the 1930s who could buy whatever they want wanted and that was in the 1930s when they were aware that the nutrient density, the vitamin and mineral content of our foods was already dropping. That was before it plummeted in the United States and other places around the world due to our changing more chemical approach to agriculture. Um, in the last 50 to 80 years, it has declined even farther. So when we say traditional foods, we also need to emphasize that these need to be grown in an organic or regenerative fashion from healthy soils. Otherwise, you will not get the nutrition. Okay, so let's get started. So why, why is nutrition important? Um, I like to start out with the big picture problems. We've had a huge upsurge in what we call chronic or degenerative disease. These are diseases that you tend to not get over that we don't have cures for actually we do have cures for them it's better nutrition but things uh, things are definitely headed in the wrong direction with our health um, cancer used to be practically unknown um, 120 years ago now it affects one in three um, diabetes was a rare rare disorder and it was it was type one diabetes it was never type two diabetes um, 60 percent of people are overweight. We know that violent and unsocial behavior is related to diet. We know that we're eating a whole bunch more carbs than our ancestors. And we know that high blood sugar and um, carbohydrates create AGEs, which are called advanced glycation end products. And those in our bodies are the major source of inflammation which is linked to all chronic disease. So too much um, high sugar diet, not enough nutrient density, and then all the pollutants um, that are in, in our food. What we're really trying to get back to is a healthy child with straight teeth, no cavities, um, good concentration, optimistic, curious, sturdy, strong, um, who sleeps sound, soundly and doesn't fly off the handle. So this is a picture of Dr. Weston A. Price, which is always an inspiration for me. When you look into this man's eyes, you see 
intelligence and caring. And I think um, he, he he's a saint in my book because he he was willing to go look outside the box and willing to go through a fair amount of um, hardship and social rejection, if you will, to do the research that can now not be done. And that resulted in the book, The Lessons um, of Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, published in 1939. This book used to be the standard required, you know, text in in many introductory anthropological um, courses in university because it so clearly um, describes the impact of nutrition on a society. So what did Weston A. Price find in these primitive, in air quotes, groups? Um, he found they had excellent health, no degenerative diseases. They had particularly wide faces. All of their teeth were straight. They had next to no cavities. We're talking one to two to five in a thousand teeth might have small cavities in them, but no root canals. They had very few birthing difficulties and they were wonderfully curious, generous, peaceful people. One of the first places he went was to the Loen Chow, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, Valley. Here's the picture of it. In uh, high in the Alps in, in Switzerland, they managed to get there um, within the first year of a track that could be negotiated by a cart um, opened up in the early 30s. And what he found was a diet that was in large part based around um, soaked and fermented um, sourdough rye bread. You can see one, one example of a great big, huge loaf like that, and dairy products. Okay, so cheese, butter, milk, and herbs from the mountainsides. What he found was children with wide dental arches, straight teeth, no cavities, and excellent health. These children went around barefoot most all of the year, splashing around in alpine streams um, on what we would consider quite a, a limited diet, and yet they had excellent health. What he had the foresight to do was to take, to follow, to go to the remote villages that were still isolated and were not eating any modern foods, and then find um, members of the families or people from that tribe or that village who had migrated to um, cities or places where the bulk of their diet was no longer traditional, their traditional diet. It was white flour, you know, canned, canned fruit and vegetables, high sugar, um, that sort of um, diet that is much more similar to ours and compare them. So the same genetic stock, but a different diet. And invariably what he found was in the modern diet, and that's um, the photos on the right, were missing teeth, decay, crooked teeth, and narrow faces. I'll get into the why of the narrow faces coming up here. He also went to the South Pacific. Once again, he went to 14 or 15 different places. The picture on the left are um, young boys from um, somewhere in the South Pacific. I don't know whether it was Vanuatu or not, um, but uh, probably Fiji. And on the right, um, people of the same genetic stock who had um, been exposed, if you will, to the modern foods and they had narrowed faces and a great deal of dental problems and modern chronic um, degenerative diseases. He also went to Australia. Look at the, the, the two sets of pictures on the, in the center and on, well, sorry, on the far left under traditional diet. The look at, you don't see 
people with those wide dental arches and all of their teeth quite straight, okay? The next um, generation of the modern diet in the middle, you can see we're already having some narrowing of the jaw and decidedly um, tooth decay. And on the right, you can see examples of, these are extreme examples clearly, but collapse of the middle third of the face and um, you know jaw dysregulation, okay? Teeth not fitting in a, a narrowed jaw. And here's the same thing um, from his times in Africa. Traditional diet, lovely smiles. It makes it easy to laugh when you have a big dental arch like that. Um, and on the far right, you can see the extreme narrowing of the jaw through lack of fat soluble vitamins. Um, and as a result, the teeth don't fit and we get these kinds of dental abnormalities, okay? which require for the most part in you know these days, braces and lots of dental work. So you might ask what's wrong with having crooked teeth? We can just fix them with braces, but the things that, that, that narrow jaws and crooked teeth represent that we can't fix with braces, if you have crooked teeth and narrow jaw, you are likely, we are likely to have narrowed nasal passages, which which means we start breathing, we become mouth breathers. We have restricted ear canals and leading to ear infections and hearing problems. We have a smaller skull, which leads to constricted glands like the hypothalamus, the pituitary, and the pineal, which are the regulatory system for all of our hormones. You have reduced surface area in the lungs, leading to asthma. We have digestive disorders, um, bone problems like flat feet and scoliosis, and narrowed or flattened pelvises, leading to difficulty with childbirth and specifically a dramatically increased need for um, C-sections. So it also leads to or tendency to have poor eyesight. So what's become common for us is children, young children with glasses and children with needing major dental work. And we end up with these kinds of narrowed faces and braces. So we are all assuming that we are, uh, we have great nutrition. We're a first world country. We can buy just about anything we want in the in the food line, um, but our health statistics tell us that we are quite likely malnourished. We may have enough to eat, but we are still not getting the key nutrients we need, particularly for brain development. And those are vitamin A, vitamin D, choline, DHA, I won't go through the whole, what that actually means, but it's also an essential fat-soluble substance. Minerals like zinc, compounds like tryptophan, and particularly cholesterol, okay? So you can see the highest sources of all of those crucial fat-soluble nutrients, okay? And we're, who's eating cod liver oil these days? Who's leading eating at least a third of a cup of butter and five or six egg yolks a day or liver several times a week? Not many of us, but traditional diets did include that level of nourishment. So what are the principles of that Weston A. Price distilled from his research and that are um, described in that, the, his book? First off, no processed food. Secondly, animal foods in every diet and an emphasis on nutrient dense food. So food that has been ideally grown in healthy soils without um, synthetic or soluble fertilizers being added without sprays and with really healthy soil that can transfer nutrients from the soil 
to the plant and then from through the plant into the animal and then available to us. And almost all of the most nutrient dense food with the highest levels of vitamin A, D, and the other fat soluble vitamins and activators come from animals. Okay, there were no, uh, to tell you this little um, side story. Weston A. Price, um, he revealed, was actually hoping to find um, vegetarian um, traditional cultures who were in robust health and reproduced easily and were, you know, healthy. He figured that might be the answer to what was happening with our teeth. He found exactly the opposite. He did not find any vegetarian slash vegan cultures that successfully reproduced for hundreds of generations. It, everything he saw and tested as being the highest nutrient density was animal-based. Okay, so what does he mean by no processed foods? All of these things. This is what I'm asking you to seriously look at cleaning out of your cupboards. And why? Because it's just frickin' dead food that is sucking energy and nutrition out of you and contributing toxins, for want of a better term. So most processed food has refined sugars, all these things are added, refined sugars, high fructose corn syrup, especially in drinks. You do not want to go down the high fructose corn syrup and all of these caffeine and sugar-based um, fizzy drinks are deadly. It really is not a good idea to let children even come close to them. Trans fats, uh, rancid seed vegetable oils, white flour, MSG, monosodium glutamate, which is a neurotoxin, artificial colors and flavors, soy protein powders, um, artificial sweeteners, preservatives up the wazoo, and nitrates and nitrites. There, when you learned to look very, very closely at the labels and explore all of the acronyms and all of the alternative wording to make what's in there not sound like it's artificial or that it's high fructose corn syrup um, or it's a preservative. It's amazing the, the lengths the food industry will go to to come up with innocuous sounding ingredients. So there are places you can go online to check out what the numbers mean and um, further what their actual um, dangers are. But ultimately, anything that says natural flavors, you have to assume that is a um, an artificial flavor because they're allowed to say natural even when they're not. So buyer beware. One of Weston A. Price's key statements in life is life in its fullness is mother nature obeyed. And by that, he means Eat foods that that are as nature delivers them with a minimal amount of processing. And almost all of the stuff on the shelves in the supermarket are processed foods and they are not Mother Nature's food. The second principle was animal foods in every diet. So by that we're talking about fish in in every form, birds, red meat. Organ meats in particular are extremely nutrient dense, preferably raw milk and milk product, eggs, reptiles, and insects. That's what he found traditional cultures were eating. They knew that those things made healthy children and made for calm people, and that's why they ate them. Um, the third principle is nutrient dense diet. He found, amazingly enough, that the traditional diets from around the world that he analyzed generally all had four times the calcium and other minerals and 10 times the fat-soluble vitamins as the modern American diet in the 1930s. It all comes back to the quality of the soil 
they are being grown in. We have to look after our soils. So he focused a lot on vitamin A and D, especially for children. These are lists of things that vitamin A and vitamin D, what we call the fat soluble vitamins that they dissolve in fat or they, they are fats themselves. Um, one of the main things about both these vitamins, you can read there what they're key for, is that we cannot assimilate, well, process and assimilate into our cells any food substance um, completely unless we have some amount of these fat soluble vitamins and activators in our diet. So you need them not only for all these great things that they're key to, you need them in, a, in order to be able to get goodness out of all of the rest of your food. So where are these things found? In all of those foods that over the last 60 or 70 years, we've been told are either bad for us or like fish livers or fish liver oil, really old fashioned and, and so horrible tasting that you wouldn't even go there. But these are the most valuable foods they are and we definitely need them for health. I promised you that I would tell you about um, why dental arches and face bones, okay. It turns out um, physiologically, why vitamin A and vitamin D in the traditional diet was so important for those broad dental arches and straight teeth and dental health and strong bones and wide round pelvises is that without adequate vitamin A and D in the maternal diet before and leading up to and during pregnancy and obviously afterwards as well, um, you, the bones can, less bone material can be put down because we require vitamin A and vitamin D and to a certain extent vitamin K2 in order for the phosphorus and calcium that forms bones to be laid down. If you haven't got vitamin A and D, you can have lots of calcium and phosphorus, but it, it doesn't get made, if you will, and become part of the fetus because vitamin A and D are required. Now, what the body tends to do in that evolutionary quandary, if you will, I mean, it's like the body and the mother and the fetus sense, okay, um, got a deficiency here. Where can we economize in the bone structure? And it's not going to be in the arms or the legs. But if uh, you don't have to have a big, broad face, the optimal formation, um, in order to reproduce. So across the maxilla, that purple bone there, is a major um, portion of the body that gets economized on. There is less um, bone tissue laid down in the, in the fetus. And as a result, there is not enough space in the jaw for all of the 32 teeth. And that's where the crooked teeth and narrow jaws, narrow faces, smaller nasal capacity happens. This is why you will never look at people's faces or the lady in the, the supermarket checkout again in quite the same way because you will be able to tell what their maternal um, nutrition was when they were in the womb based on the width of their faces. And it's been shown repeatedly that we are instinctively attracted to wide-faced um, people as, as our innate interpretation of beauty. We're getting over that now. I mean, just look at Keanu Reeves and people like that. As movie stars' faces get narrower and narrower, um, we become accustomed to that. But you look at all the older generation movie stars, they all had square jaws and odd faces. And I just want to add, um, beta carotene, like what we get from carrots and tomatoes, is not the same as vitamin A because it takes a whole bunch more energy 
and additional fat soluble vitamins in order to turn beta carotene into a usable form of vitamin A. So, and, and there are lots of complications in making that um, conversion from beta carotene to vitamin A, including the fact that most children under three or five years of age are not physically capable of making that conversion. So it's like particularly important to get vitamin A and D in its natural forms into children. Okay, so that's pretty self-explanatory. Basically, the healthy fats um, are what we need for growth and energy, and as I highlighted, for the absorption and the metabolism of most nutrients. Looking for healthy um, children with good brain function, good hormone levels, and healthy skin, eyes, and bones, they need to be eating a lot of butter, tallow and suet from beef and, and um, mutton, lard from pigs, any form of um, chicken or goose fat, palm kernel, but I want to stress that, that palm and coconut oils and olive oils are actually comparatively low in vitamin A and D, okay? And they should not be cooked with. Okay, so we absolutely need saturated fat for our cell membranes to function. And I think that's a major reason why we're seeing chronic diseases. Our cell membranes aren't letting in what it should or spelling what it ought to. It, it, we, when, we, when we undernourish, we don't have enough cholesterol um, for the lipid bilayer around every single cell in our body, then we are going to have chronic disease way it is. So once again, um, when we think, well, we need carbohydrates for, for metabolism, for energy, actually, metabolically, humans are ketogenic. Our bodies are meant to metabolize fat as the primary fuel source um, because it is so much more nutrient dense. We did not evolve with grains, we involved with mastodons and um, woolly mammoths uh, in the ice age, and the grains came later. So I just won't go into the whole cholesterol argument, but I just want to say that as, as this um, graph shows, our as our butter consumption went down, this is from the US, but it's applicable anywhere, as our pounds of butter per year went down um, starting in the 1920s, our heart disease and cancer rates went up. What this tells us is that fat, saturated animal fat consumption does not cause either heart disease or cancer. So calcium um, is important. Bone broth, you probably will have all heard of that. Really important to try and get our calcium from natural sources. And real milk. We're so blessed here in New Zealand to have mostly um, grass-fed animals, um, a, a growing, slowly growing organic dairy industry, and ultimately, um, if you look hard enough, access to real raw milk um, within a couple hours' drive from here. Okay, the fact that they're on diverse pastures is very important for the quality of that milk. And yes, raw milk is safe. Uh, the whole scare tactics about raw um, pregnant women not drinking raw milk or raw dairy products is um, a fabrication. It's a paranoia that developed in the 1910s and 1920s. Won't go into that story, but um, ultimately, there is no science behind grass-fed, hygienically milked um, raw milk from healthy cows. It is an extremely valuable health product. And the difference between the value of raw milk versus pasteurized milk um, is with these, these were guinea pig studies cited here. Uh, the, the raw milk guinea pigs 
had excellent growth and no, no abnormalities. And the pasteurized whole milk, poor growth, um, emaciation, weakness, atrophied muscles, and death within one year. Same sort of thing happened with rats. Just want to briefly go into the problems with soy foods, soy products, soy plant biochemicals block the absorption of vital nutrients and minerals. It blocks thyroid function and it irritates um, the intestinal tract. And here are all the studies showing the dangers of soy infant formula. Don't go there. Um, it would be, there are, um, you're better off, and I have coached several families through this, to use the Weston A. Price formula for raw milk um, infant formula if you truly, uh, if the mother truly cannot feed that child. In large part, to put it simply, soy formula has so much hormone altering um, estrogen in it that it is the equivalent of feeding a baby four to five birth control pills a day. You really don't want to go there. The other thing that's in processed food, especially MSG, hydrolyzed protein, aspartame, are neurotoxins called excitotoxins. They really wreak havoc on the brain. So these excitotoxins are in almost all processed food. So instead, we want to go to the new food pyramid based on fresh, grass-fed, high-fat um, animal products, milk and um, eggs, vegetables, and fruit in moderation, and certainly not bananas and a lot of sweet fruit every day. We want to keep those carbs down and focus on getting our energy from fats. So here's what a healthy breakfast might look like. Healthy lunches. I really go for the salami. You can always make your own. Healthy dinners. It doesn't mean you can't have spices and those sorts of things, but we're just focusing on freshly cooked food. And healthy snacks. Okay, so that question of can we turn um, degenerative diseases around? The short answer is yes. These conditions can be improved with nutrient-dense food, uh, and there are other techniques or approaches we can use, but here are some of the things that can be lessened or reversed with nutrient-dense food. Learning disabilities, hyperactivity, autism, frequent infections, behavioral problems, chronic fatigue, um, osteopenia, so weak bones, allergies, asthma, dental decay, mood issues, and vitamin deficiency. We could talk a bit more about that. So here are the first steps that the Weston A. Price Foundation recommends. Ditch the sugar. I mean, use honey. I wouldn't recommend agave. Almost all of it is processed, but just use less. Um, use fruit or con fruit concentrate instead. Uh, replace fruit juices with raw milk. Replace breakfast cereals with actual eggs and soaked oatmeal and um, more eggs. So use raw and cultured dairy product. Eliminate all processed soy foods. Eliminate all vegetable seed oils. And that includes bran, canola, soy, sunflower. All of them are the result of industrial processes that, that have um, toxic metals and um, bleach and a whole series of colorings and additives that make them even vaguely palatable. So whole foods, nothing boxed or prepared, and ideally nothing, um, nothing out of tin cans. Start preparing or, or harvesting your own food and preserving it. And ideally take some form of high quality, and that means not from a um, pharmacy, cod liver oil. So I wanted to add these slides as well, because the whole question of 
Maori nutrition and health is a big one and has been for decades. Why do we have such poor um, Maori health statistics compared to the rest of the New Zealand population? When Weston A. Price came, he went with Sir Apiranata to the East Cape and he took, did the same, go to the villages and take dental records and photographs and food samples. So on the left are four typical wide arched, wide mouth, you know, beautiful, curious people. And on the right, at the same time, he went and talked with the dental nurses at the time and took photographs of <clears throat> Pakia. Um, sorry children and adults and found a great deal of tooth decay. And that was sort of the origin of the New Zealand School Dental Clinics. These photos are taken at the same time, but of children who had either gone to boarding school <clears throat> and had been exposed to food like this or who were living in and near cities and were not on their traditional diet. <clears throat> now, there's a quote from Weston A. Price's book um, that, I, that I hope is inspiration to all of us. And it says, the Maori race developed a knowledge of nature's laws and adopted a system of living in harmony with those laws to so high a degree that they were able to build what was reported by early scientists to be the most physically perfect race living on the face of the earth. They accomplished this largely through diet and a system of social organization designed to provide a high degree of perfection in their offspring. To do this, they utilize food from the sea very liberally. <clears throat> it is possible in our environment to have and to become, possibly in several generations, um, people with a tremendous degree of physical um, beauty and integrity. So um, using Weston A. Price's principles is a major way, in my opinion, of moving towards that. Final photos here are, these are two African boys recently taken. These two are first cousins. The one on the left was raised in the city the one on the right was still on his traditional diet. You can see the huge differences that can happen in just uh, within a generation. And I would like to encourage you all to support your local pharmacy because that's where your health comes from. So that's my last slide. That was fabulous. Thank you, Phyllis. I enjoyed the interview so much. The refreshing of the Western A. Price Foundation was like welcoming an old friend back into my life. I'm a big fan of mini life audits and I'll be running one again in mine soon. Something new to me is Phyllis's skin care made with animal fats. That's a new thing to me and I have an order on its way to me. See the Western A. Price Foundation website for getting started in this lifestyle or adding to what you know. If you want to contact Phyllis for garden and farm health or see her basic range of skincare and tinctures for humans or animals, go to Helia, that's H-E-L-I-A dot co dot N-Z and I'll put those websites in the description box also. Part two of Phyllis's interview will be coming up soon. Together, we explore how to focus the Western A. Price Foundation into our homeschooling, and I get to have my questions answered. Mm -hmm.